Uh, we have uh, our alkene handout to finish up. We also have, we need to look at the intro to alkenes handout, which had the uh, nomenclature. We need to look at that. Uh, we're looking at uh, oxymercuration, hyperboration, those two reactions. And we made it down to here. Okay, we have an alkene. It happens to be cyclic. That's an alkene. Uh, what are we doing? Hydrogenation, oxidation. What does that do to an alkene? Uh, non more carbon to hydration of the alkene to give an alcohol. Yes. Okay, is the OH going to end up on top or bottom? Yeah, you've got to figure out how to know that in your mind because where does cation, where does cation end up? If it was formed? Top. So this cation is there, what ends up there after the cation? That's where the H ends up shifting to. So this, you've got to get this all straight in your mind. That's called understanding the reaction mechanism. You also need to be able to show it. So we showed the product. We could just show the product without steric chemistry. We showed last time. Um, right there. There's a new there's an OH there and there's a new H here. And the nucleophile, which looks like it could have been water, but it, it really wasn't water, but that's simplistically it could have been water. It looks like it ended up on the less substituted carbon. That's actually anti Uh But is this going to be cis or trans? Who says cis? So you said those two groups are going to be cis. Who says trans? OK. Uh, these two groups are going to be trans. You're going to get that. You're going to get trans plus an antimer. An antimer is where that will be bold and that will be dashed. An antimer will also be trans. The antimers will be formed in a 50-50 mixture and that will be called racemic. I got it. Why is it trans? It's because the OH and the new H, here's the water that we added. <coughs> These two groups are cis. But when we look at this, we don't consider the H. We consider the, the non-H, the substituents. The substituents are trans because the OH and H are cis. Why is the OH and H cis? Well, it has to do with where does the H come from? Because the mechanism of this is this attacks boron, and that gives, we'll find something that writes, this bonds to BH3, but it's going to be tetrahedral. So it's either going to be forward or back. Uh, let's draw it forward. BH3. Boron is now minus. That's a carbocation if it was formed. But it's not really formed because we know that we're going to get this hydride shift at the same exact time that this is being formed. Now, when the hydride shift comes in, the H2 electrons shift over here, a 1 3 hydride shift. It looks like it's a long distance away. We can make it a little closer. You said it was a 1, 3 hydride shift? 1, 2, 3. If, okay, if okay. that's 1, it's going to end up at the 3. I got you. Okay. Uh, the electrons over here, right? Yeah. They shift over. They, they migrate over. Now, your book will show a transition state. I'm not showing a transition state. Now, when that moves over, what do you get? The boron is still formed. 
Now there's an H here, but that's going to become tetrahedral. Right now it's turning a planar. Two in the plane, one forward, one back. Is the new H going to be forward or back? It's got to be forward. Why does it have to be forward? Because it's coming from the boron, which is forward. Here's the alkene. Okay, pretend like this is just here. Well, here here's the alkene, the two carbons. I bond it to the boron. Okay? And the boron transfers an H to this carbon. Make a bond at H. You're going to have to split your arm off. But if this is forward, doesn't that new bond also have to be forward? Because it's coming from this side. How can the new H be bonded back here if it's coming from the boron that's over here? The new H and the boron are on the same side. So we would draw the H forward because it came from the boron, which is forward. That pushes the methyl back. And this is in step one. And we've hydroborated the alkene. Hydroborated. We've added BH3 across the alkene. But it's a stereospecific addition. The boron and the H are, have been added cis. Look at the handout, the outline, pink. Uh, letter Roman numeral six. The first entry, concerted mechanism. It's a concerted what type of addition? Sin or cis. It's, it means sin and cis are synonymous. It's cis. It's a cis addition of BH3. Because the H comes from the boron, they have to be, okay? So it's a sin addition of BH3. Now, what's the magic step do? It replaces the boron with an OH. Do we have any change in stereochemistry when we do that? No. No. We wrote that on the board. Just, just erase this. Okay, you can redraw it. I'm just going to erase it and put an OH. That's what the magic step does. And we did not look at that mechanism. And so what do we have now? Well, that's what's circled over there. And if you get rid of the age, it's still there, and ask, are the substituents, the substituents, the non-ages, are they cis or trans? They're trans, which is what we said there. The OH and H are cis. Those groups are trans, plus an antimer. How do you get the enantiomer? Well, the alkene, here the alkene attacked the boron to the front, but you could also attack the boron from the back side. And this could have been dashed. If that was dashed, the H would have been dashed. Uh, that means you would have dashed here, and that would have been bolded because the H would have been dashed. The antimer, as we're going to learn, if, uh, if your backbone is the same, your projections switch. So the answer is trans. Questions about that? Hopefully that makes sense. Does what I do? No, the H is right here. There's an H there. Right? This is a line bond structure. We're not showing the H. The H is there. Uh, how about this down here? Uh, what is, what's the name of this two-step process? Oxymercuration reduction. What does that do to an alkene? The way to hydrate an alkene, is it the standard product? Yeah. Or Kondikov product, standard product. I'd rather say standard. It's going to be where you expect cation. Just, it's just like if you hydrated with H3O+, except you don't get any rearrangements here. Use H3O plus, you're prone to get into arrangements. But that involves a carbocation. This does not. Product here is 
hopefully you all have this drum. It's a product. New H is down here. We've added H to O. The OH is up here. Because where, where would you make cation at? The top. That's why the nucleophiles at the top. Of course, it's a more complex mechanism. Uh, but it gives more Kamnikov product. There's no stereochemistry here. That's not chiral. A chiral. Not chiral. Since it's not chiral, you don't need to show any projections. Because there's no different ways of showing it. As long as everything's connected, that's it. But these are chiral. We'll be learning that as we go forward. But we certainly have mentioned that a good bit. How do we do on the one on the bottom? Um, we need to look at the intro to alkenes handout. Uh, the next reaction on the pink sheet is down to other reactions. We'll be looking at hydrogenation of alkenes, okay, using H2. Before we do that, though, we need to look at some things over on the uh, intro packet. properties of alkenes. Okay, these two, these are two different alkenes, right? They're different because the pi bond restricts the rotation. You can have the two chlorines, chlorine green trans, or you can have it have them cis. And this cannot rotate like an alkene. If this was an alkene, we could spin it, and then we could talk about different conformations. And maybe we can have a, a sin conformation and an anti-conformation. That's the same compound, just different conformation. This is two different compounds, because it cannot rotate. It's stuck like this, two different compounds. The alkene is said to be stereogenic. Because of the presence of the alkene, we have stereoisomers. These are stereoisomers, right? Certainly they have the same formula. Then the question is, is the connectivity the same or different? Mm -hmm. The connectivity is the same. Don't confuse connectivity with projection. Uh, these have the same connectivity. How do you know they have the same connectivity? Because they have the same name. What's the name of this? 1,2-dichloroethene. Right? Ethene. Okay. So what's the name of that? 1,2-dichloroethene. Because the chlorines are connected at the same positions. It has nothing to do with projection. It's not connectivity. Same exact name. Since they have the same exact name, they're not constitutional isomers. That, that means they have different connectivity. These are stereoisomers. Same connectivity, just different projection. Stereoisomers have the same exact name. They only differ by some type of descriptor in the front. What descriptor do you want to put in front of this one? Trans, that's a stereochemical descriptor. What do you want to put in front of this one? Cis. Cis, and then the same exact name. <coughs> Stereoisomers have the same exact name, except for some descriptor that describes the projection of the groups. 
work. Okay? Two different compounds. Because they're different compounds, they have different properties most likely. For example, <coughs> we can ask questions. Which one do you expect to have the highest boiling point? If these are liquids. Which would you expect to have the higher boiling point? What is, what's going to influence boiling point? Surface area. <coughs> Surface area, but that's the same pretty much. In general though, <coughs> IMFs, right? What influences IMFs? We looked at four things. They were in order of importance. Surface area was the least important. That was number one. What came next? Dipole. Dipole. Okay. Or polarity. Dipole could be individual dipole or molecular dipole. Uh, polarity. Uh, are they both polar or is one nonpolar? No. These two dipoles go like that. They're equal and opposite. They cancel. This compound is nonpolar. How about this one? Those cancel? No. No. Polar. These can be summed up to one dipole that comes like this. This is polar. So now, which would have a higher boiling point? Six. The polar one. Which means the molecule has positive portion and negative portion. Well, the positive portion of one molecule is going to be attracted to the negative portion of another molecule by dipole interaction. That's an IMF. More IMF, higher boiling point. Highest boiling point? Cis. Uh, which would be most soluble in water? Trans. Oh, sorry, cis. cis. Also cis. Why? Because that's the polar one. Water is a very polar solvent. Like it dissolves light. Now, I doubt this is actually soluble in water. But that's harder for you guys to predict. It's easier for you guys to prepare. <laughs> this would be most soluble. Is it completely soluble? I, I personally doubt it, but that's a different question. Okay, which of these two is the most stable? <coughs> Somebody says trans, why? Well, uh, if we had confirmations, which confirmation would be more stable? Sin or anti? Anti. Anti, why? Because biggest groups further apart. It's the same thing. I mean, if this, if this could freely rotate, it would be one compound. And then we would say which conformer would be more stable? Sin or cis or anti or call, call trans. It's the same idea. Anti is a better comparator. Trans is a better uh, compound. Because these large groups, which with chlorines, have lots of lone pairs, core electrons, lone pairs. This chlorine is pretty big. These things being trans, they're going to give them more room. It's just like a confirmation. Anti is best. With alkene isomers, trans is typically best. Unless there's something going on. <coughs> For example, remember we had an example with uh, conformers where Gauss was preferred? Why was Gauss preferred in that case? Hydrogen bonding? Yeah. So there could be something. But in general, trans is better. Uh, better means more stable. That's what better means. Uh, so that one is more stable. Somebody said something about dipoles. What's the idea of dipoles affecting this? They just cancel out the source. It's not affecting. That really doesn't affect stability. That affects the polarity. Uh, trans more stable. Big groups have more room, room, just like a confirmation. But these are not conformers. You can see a multiple choice question somewhere. They're going to say, hey, are these conformers, are these constitutional isomers, are these stereoisomers, or whatnot? The answer would be stereoisomers, right? These are not conformers. These are different compounds. Ah, uh, I think we got that. How about these two? Which is most stable? 
huh. Well, this is not a cis or trans question because this is trans, but this is not even. First off, what's the relationship between these two? What term would you use to this? Are they isomers? Yeah, you added up, they have the same formula. Okay, what type? There's only two types of isomers, constitutional and stereo. Constitutional. Yeah, why are they constitutional? Different connectivity. Different connectivity, how do you know that? Because they have different name. What's the name of this one? 2 butene. Now we need something else because 2 butene has a stereoized but What do you want to put? Trans. Trans. Or you could put E. That'll work also, right? Is this also 2 butene? No. No. No, what is this? 1 butene. Do you need a descriptor in front of this? No. No, there's no stereoized for 1 butene. This alkene is stereogenic, this alkene is not. Do they have the same name? No, then they're not stereoisomers. The stereoisomers have the same name. These are constitutional isomers. I mean, here you have two methyls on each end of the alkene, connected to each end of the alkene. Here you don't have two methyls connected to each end of the alkene, so you have different connectivity. Okay. So these are constitutional isomers, but which one's most stable? It's not a cis or trans question. So this is a different point. This is a different point. Actually, this guy is more stable. It has nothing to do that it's trans, because we're not comparing it to cis. It has to do with this is a disubstituted Two substituents on the alkene. This is just a mono substituted. Alkene only has one substituent. Yes, it's longer, but okay. Now, when I say substituents, this usually refers to carbon substituents. The take home is a more substituted alkene is going to be more stable. Why? Well, we can look at this group of four down here, and we could ask which is more stable. First, answer the question, which is more stable of the four? First thing you need to notice is these are all isomers. They all have the same formula. Now, some of them may be stereo. Actually, they're all constitutional. None of them are stereoisomers of each other. Um, that's important because we do want to compare apples to apples. <laughs> Which one's most stable? First. Well, what do we say up here? What do we say up here? More substituents. One was more substituents on the alkene. So which one is that? This one here, right? Most stable. How many substituents on that alkene? Four. How many on this one? One. Only one. This one? Two. And three. Four. If I understand what a substituent is on an alkene, that's the one that's most stable. Okay, but we really haven't said why yet. The why, let's look down below at this table. It has to do with the types of carbon-carbon bonds. And we know how to judge bond strength. This table refers to those there. They're just listed differently. Here's the one that we said is most stable. It has to do with the types of carbon-carbon bonds that this guy has compared to that one. They all have one of these types, sp2 binding to sp2. That's the sigma bond of each, pot, of each double bond. That's consistent. Look down here. First off, of B and C, 
Which type of carbon bond would be strong, B or C? Bond would be stronger, B or C? B. B. Yes, it's shorter, and usually equivalent to something like that. It's stronger. But it has to do with you're using a more stable orbital here, lower energy orbital. That's consistent. Lower energy orbital compared to higher energy orbital, lower energy orbital is going to make stronger bond. Okay? But look, this guy has four of these types. Because every carbon-carbon bond coming off the alkene is sp2, sp3, sp2, sp3, four of those. Where this guy over here only has one of those strong types. It's just, just that right there. The other carbon-carbon bonds are sp3, 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 sp3. So it has three of the weaker type. Where over here, this guy has none of the weaker type. They're all the stronger type because they're all bonded to the alkene carbon. That's why the more substituted is more stable. It has more of the stronger bond. Okay? But the take home is more substituents on the alkene. And usually we're talking about carbon substituents. Because if these substituents become something other than carbon, then it can kind of vary and you're comparing apples to oranges. And it's, okay? Usually this is just sort of hydrocarbon type of question. All right? Now this is not something you we look at today and you, you get it right on the test and you forget about it. This is going to be important many times through organic one and organic two. This is a more stable alkene. Questions about that page? Uh, we missed a couple. Uh, what did we say up here? Uh, which of these four would give off the most heat when burned? <clears throat> well, the most stable or least stable? When they're, when they're burned, they all become uh, one, two, three, four. They all produce six CO2 and in some number of H2O. They all produce the same thing because they all have the same formula. They burn. So they all come down to this point. Which one gives off the most heat? The one that starts here or the one that starts here? I mean, which one of these scenarios is giving off more heat? This one, right? All this heat is coming way down compared to where it's so Which one is this? The most stable or least stable? Least stable. Hopefully you clearly understand. That's the least stable, right? This is energy, right? Least stable. The least stable is going to give off the most heat. The least stable contains the most heat to begin with. Heat is energy. Which one of these contains the most potential energy? If you want to call it potential energy, it's heat. Same thing. The most stable or least stable? The least stable contains the most potential energy. That's why it's less stable. I got lots of energy. So the one that gives off the most heat when burned, which one would that be? Yeah, the first one. So if you wanted, if you for some reason were going to run your factory by using one of these as a fuel, and they all cost the same amount, which one would you want to buy to, to run your factory? I'd buy this one. You're going to get more bang for your buck. Oh, this less stable, which means it contains more energy. Which one has the lowest HF? What does that mean? Heat formation. formation. Which one would have the lowest heat formation? Most you got to be careful about lowest because if it's a negative number, lowest actually means even more, more lower than none. So 
which would have the lowest HF? Yes. Are we looking for the most stable or the least stable? Most. Somebody said most? Make sure you understand uh, why that is. A uh, couple of miscellaneous things here. We're looking at alkenes. We know the alkene is a site of unsaturation. Uh, let's make sure we understand the term uh, saturated fats. Unsaturated fats. Okay, a fatty acid has a carboxylic acid and then this long hydrocarbon chain which is called fatty. Fatty meaning lipophilic and nonpolar. Most of the fats in your body are typically like that. Hydrocarbon, nonpolar. So a fatty acid. Now this would be called a saturated fat because the side chain is fully saturated. Now, of course, you've got the carbonyl, which is a site of unsaturation. So when you're discussing fatty acids this weekend, and someone says uh, it's a saturated fat, you can think, well, you can call it that. It actually has one degree of unsaturation. Um, so referring to the side chain. This guy here would be, OK. It's got one unsaturated position. This would be called a monounsaturated fat. Now, this alkene is that cis or trans? Cis. Okay. And most of your good fats are unsaturated, and they have cis alkenes. This would be a monounsaturated fat. This would be sort of a a diunsaturated or polyunsaturated fat. And then you could add even more. You see how they're cis? And your cis fats, good thing about them is they're liquids at room temperature. Where the saturated fat is a solid at room temperature. The difference here, because when you have the cis alkene, this puts kink in the chain. And the chain can no longer be just straight linear. When it's linear, all these chains can just stack on each other and you get good IMFs by like uh, Van der Waals. Okay, we can stack. But if you put a kink, they can't stack as well because now you got all these kinky bones. <laughs> okay? So why are these better for you than the solid fit? Solid fat will get into your arteries and become solid and clog up your arteries. <laughs> Where these unsaturated fats will remain more liquid and they won't clog up your arteries. Okay? So the kink is good. Now you can have trans fats. What's that? Well, that's where you have a fat that has trans double bonds. This one predict has one cis. Now it turns out, it's hard to explain, but when you have trans double bonds, the melting point actually goes back up. That's not easy to explain here. We can give a partial one the explanation. The trans fats go back to tend to be solids at room temperature. They're more likely to clog your arteries again. The non-clogging ones are the ones that, are, that have the cysts. Okay? So stay away from saturated fats and trans fats. These are the ones that are in like olive oil. So that's a little application of the terminology. Let's see how we do it over here. I know a couple of you have uh, been asking questions about this one. So let's try here. This drug is given as a mixture of E and Z. You've got to recognize that these are stereoisomers. 
alkene stereoisomers with one being E, one being Z. Given as a mixture of these. Is this one here E or Z? E. Okay, what's the high priority group on this carbon? Carbon or H? Clearly carbon. What's the high priority group on this carbon? Carbon or carbon? Carbon. One of the carbon takes that H. That's the same exact thing. Is it the same uh, to the end, or what if we go here? Same? What if we go here? Now we get a difference. O or carbon? Oh, so this way is going to be uh, the high priority. Okay. So I established the two high priorities, Z or E? Z. They're on the same side. Thus, this one is what? E. Well, that's got to be E, because that's the other one. It's like if this is the right hand, which one am I have behind my back? The left. Got to be the other one. If that's Z, the other one's got to be E. You can determine it on your own, but I'll bet you a sink dinner that it's E. How do you do on those two? Uh, let's turn over here. Another application refrigerants. Uh, a lot of your freons, there's different types now, they contain your fluorinated alkenes, different halogens. First off, how does this nomenclature look? <laughs> well, well, don't look at the nomenclature. <laughs> We can name it and get the same exact name. Uh, how do you want to name this company? One, two, three. I see three carbon <coughs> chain. So that's what? And it's got an alkene, so it's what? Pro propene? Pro yeah. I mean, that's propene. Now you can say one propene, but do you actually need the one? don't actually need it because there's no such thing as two propene. Okay, what's on the one propene? What's the one position? Top or over here? Top. Uh, uh, yeah. One, two, three. So what do we have on the propene? Two. Two. We have a fluorine at the two. And we have three fluorines at the three. So it's two, three, three, three. Tetra, so you can combine them all and call it tetra. As long as you indicate where they're at. There's two, three, 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 tetra, flora, one broken. Not that bad, yeah? Do we need a stereochemical descriptor? But you can't trust uh, you know, journalists. They, they may have left the name out. Do we need a stereochemical descriptor? Why not? There's nothing on the other side. This alkene is not stereogenic. There's no, there's no E or Z possibility. Okay? How about down here? You can do the names on your own for practice. But is this alkene stereogenic? Yes. 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 It's trans there. That's why they say trans. You could also show that as cis. Same thing down here. So you can use those as sort of practice. Practice your nomenclature. Sure, those are right. They are right. Now, in organic two, I give this same handout, and down here, I ask you to look at here and determine which one of these is wrong, because down here, one of these structures is wrong. Okay, but up there, all the nomenclature is right. Okay. Uh, any questions about that handout?
Okay, let's look at the last alkene reaction. That's shown here. This is hydrogenation also known as reduction of alkenes. We're using hydrogen, H2, elemental hydrogen gas. We can add the H2 across the pi bond, just like bromine. Br2, we put a bromine on each carbon. Well, H2, we put an H on each carbon. And when you do that, lo and behold, you get this product here. There's a new H there and a new H there, right? Here there's two on the end, now there's three on the end, etc. Maybe this is the most easiest reaction of organic chemistry. But guess what? There's stair chemistry involved, be aware of. Now, this is not an ionic mechanism. What is ionic mechanism? Ionic mechanism is a mechanism that involves ion intermediates. And all the mechanisms we've done have involved ion intermediates. This does not involve any ions. Uh, to do this, you have to have a precious metal catalyst, such as palladium, platinum, nickel, rhodium. These are the expensive ones. Cheap ones, base metals like iron and zinc, don't work. Okay? Now, it's only one of these, your choice. I had a student one time, somebody had them all. <laughs> just, just one, your choice. Uh, palladium is very common. Actually, the first three are most common. But rhodium, some of the others are kind of specialized, and when your reaction is difficult, uh, these three are the most common. Um, now, mechanism for this. I'm not going to give a reaction uh, arrow movement mechanism. I'll just sort of explain it. Sort of explain up here in the drawings. The circle here, this is the, the surface of the precious metal catalyst. And what happens is the hydrogen gets absorbed onto that surface. And somehow, again, this is not very clear, the surface helps break the bonds. The pi bond approaches the surface, and these H's are essentially, and this is not that scientific, but they're just shot into the pi bond. Okay? So you're the metal surface. The H's have sort of associated with you, and your H, the H's have become ready to shoot. Okay. The pi bond's walking down the street, <laughs> and it approaches the metal catalyst, and boom, two H's come in, and two it's no longer a pi bond. It's now an alkane. My bond's gone because two H's have been added. Okay. So this is sort of trying to illustrate that. And we have hydrogenated the alkene. Now when you add H's, that's also known as a reduction in organic chemistry. So you can also say we've reduced the alkene. You can also say we've saturated the alkene. Well, it's no longer unsaturated. It's now saturated with H's. There's a different terminology. Stereochemistry. When we have stereochemistry, are the two new H's going to be on the same side or opposite? Well, how did they come in? You go, make bonds, here are your H's. Make bonds. Boom. Okay. Are they on the same side or opposite? Same. On the same side. They came from the metal. They're not going to be like this because they both come from the metal. Okay? So is it a sin addition or an anti addition? It's a sin addition of hydrogen. Is that what it says down there on the pink sheet? Stereochemistry. It's a sin or cis addition of the hydrogen. Okay, so we'll have to see the consequences of that.
So if you take this alkene, what is this? One, two, three, four. One pentene. Hydrogenate it, you're going to get just pentane. Now you could also take two pentene and hydrogenate it and get the same product. Just make sure you see that. Now before we move on, we can ask questions like this. Which route to pentane is more exothermic? First off, this reaction would be exothermic. You could do a calculation. But how do we know it would be exothermic most likely just by assessing it? Pi bond. And if you come from here at the top, what have we made? Pi bond has been removed, and what do we add? Two. Two sigma bonds. Those are going to be stronger. So hydrogenation is typically exothermic. Again, you can pull out your calculator and do that calculation and see that. This would also be, of course, down here, you're adding a new H here and here. But it's the same product. Which reaction would be more exothermic? Well, they're both coming to, uh, they're both coming to C, right? Do they start at the same position? Which one is uh, more stable, A or B? Ah, which one's more stable? B. B. So we would put B here, and relatively we'd put A here, and then when we hydrogenate, there's going to be some transition state. Shoot the H's. See the transition state as the H's came in? Settles down here. Which one's more exothermic? Hey, because it starts at a higher position. That would be more exothermic. Over here. I've already given you the product, but let's make sure we understand why it's cis only. Here we have stair chemistry that's showing up and it needs to be shown. You hydrogenate with palladium. A lot of times your metal is dispersed onto some inert medium like charcoal, or carbon. It helps increase the surface area of your precious metal catalyst. So that's what that is. We add an H to each carbon, we're going to get the alkane. But we're left with two groups here. Are they going to be cis or trans? Cis. Why are they going to be cis? Because the two new H's are what? Because the H's are cis, because they came from the catalyst, but that's going to by default make the other two groups cis. Now, it doesn't say it here, but you also are going to get the enantiomer. An enantiomer would be where both bonds are dashed. Because the, the compound shown, the product shown, is where the H's came in from the back. Push the groups forward. But you can also have it where the hydrogen is coming from the front. Push the groups back. Okay. All right, I wish we had five minutes because we need to introduce stereochemistry. Let me give you a 30-minute introduction. We're going to hit stereochemistry hard on Monday. Did I say 30 minutes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 30 yeah. seconds. Enantiomers. What are enantiomers? You need to know when you come to class on Monday. Okay? You got Google, Wikipedia, you got your textbook. Okay? Enantiomers. These are enantiomers. They have the same connectivity. I got a thumb next to a pointy finger. Thumb next to a pointy finger. Same connectivity. If this looks in the mirror, what would it see? It would see this. No. Hold your hand up in the mirror when you get home. You'll see that coming back at you. These are mirror images. But are they the same? No. Only this one will fit into the right hand glove. I still can't make this one fit into the left-hand glove. Let me 
these are not the same. Mirror images that are not the same are called enantiomers. Compounds can be that way. If this looked into the mirror, what would it see? It would see that looking back at it. Are these mirroring each other? Yeah. They're not the same because you can't stack them. We're out of time. Please be looking at stair chemistry. We'll hit that hard on Monday. Do this on Monday. Uh, this afternoon downstairs.